Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to today's show, I want to let you know that we're offering our podcast listeners a special 20% lifetime discount to the China Africa Daily Brief. Now that's the newsletter that Cobus and I produce every day that provides the most comprehensive digest of everything China's doing on the continent and now increasingly throughout the global south. In addition to the newsletter, you'll also get full archive access to the website and the China Africa Experts Network as well. To get that discount, just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe and use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we're once again going to step away from Africa to focus on China's burgeoning relationship in the Middle East and Persian Gulf. There was a lot of news in this space last week when Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi wrapped up a tour to five nations on a six-day trip throughout the Persian Gulf and that also took him to Turkey. Uh, Here was his itinerary. I think I got the uh, order right. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran, Oman, the United Arab Emirates. Now, a lot of the focus was on energy. Now, keep in mind that China gets now 35% of its imported energy from the Persian Gulf. Saudi Arabia, in particular, is now China's largest oil supplier ahead of Russia, Iraq, the United States. And just before Wang's trip, the Saudi national oil company Saudi Aramco said it would secure China's energy security for 50 years, the next half century. And also just before the trip that uh, there was some news out of Qatar where Sinopec, which is one of the major Chinese oil companies, they awarded a 10-year tender to buy 1 million tons a year of natural gas to the Qatari gas company Qatar Gas. So... Energy is very important, and that was in a lot of headlines. There's also a headline this week that came out of Reuters that Chinese oil imports from Iran in March, just this month alone, will come in at around a million barrels a day. Now, all of that oil is being transshipped or laundered through third-party countries like the UAE, Malaysia, Oman, and other countries in order to sidestep U.S. sanctions. But that is a very small part of the broader China-Iran story. And during Wang Yi's trip, there was a lot of news on the Iran front. So the two sides signed a highly anticipated strategic cooperation agreement that, if you trust the New York Times, is supposedly worth somewhere around $400 billion. It will stretch out across 25 years. And this is a deal that has really spooked people in Washington and at the editorial writers at The Wall Street Journal who see this as China forming a new geopolitical axis to rival the United States. But a lot of other people, including our guest today, say the deal is actually not that important and shouldn't be overstated. But all of this combined adds up to what appears to be a much more ambitious Chinese foreign policy agenda in the Middle East. And we're going to talk about that today. So a couple of the things that came up on this trip. Wang Yi brought China's message about Xinjiang, which was especially notable in Saudi Arabia, given that it's home to the holy Muslim sites of Mecca and Medina. China apparently also wants to become a broker in the Middle East peace process between Arabs and Israelis, and they've invited the two sides to come to Beijing. Why on God's earth they would want to do that, I have no idea, but maybe we'll get some enlightenment on that. And finally, Wang Yi made a big announcement in the United Arab Emirates, where he announced a joint venture deal in Abu Dhabi between a UAE company and Sinopharm to produce COVID-19 vaccines in the Emirates. So, Cobus, there's no doubt a lot going on on this trip, and it was a very important tour. Yeah, it's, it's really notable, and it's, it's it's very interesting to see the stuff that they focused on. You know, it's also really, I think, important for Africa, the, this, you know, to, to keep note of this tour, because, you know, the um, the Middle East has become such a such an important kind of base for Chinese companies working in Africa, and also for African companies. I saw I saw a, a, um, 
a statistic recently that something like 10,000 African companies have their headquarters in in Dubai. Uh, you know, and, and I, I was laughing that it's, it's such an African statistic that they that that their most important business city is not actually on the continent. Um, but uh, you know, so so it's it's really it's really important to see how cha- how China is engaging with that area and and how that wider landscape is changing. Well, let's get a perspective on this from someone who carefully follows China's engagement in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East. Jonathan Fulton is an assistant professor of political science at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, and he's also a senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. And it is wonderful to have you back on the show. A very good afternoon, Jonathan. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Really, uh, it's an honor. one of my favorite podcasts. Oh, well, you're too kind, and we're just so happy to have you right now, given all that's happened. I dedicated a big chunk of our newsletter for the past couple of days to the trip, in part because it does show this really dynamic Chinese foreign policy. Things are in motion right now. Again, a lot of oil buying that used to take place in Africa has now shifted to uh, the Persian Gulf. Also, again, all the different things that Wang Yi did during the trip. What do you think was the most important event of the different stops that he did and the different news that he made in terms of the of the bigger picture? The biggest one, I think, and I might be biased because I live in Abu Dhabi, but I think the announcement that um, that Sinopharm is going to be manufactured here and distributed around the Middle East is is a major story. Now, I know everybody's looking at Iran and thinking this is a big deal. Um, I think if we can do anything, we should try to calm those editorial and op-ed writers you were talking about, because it's really not that big a deal. Um, and, and I'll be happy to talk about this a lot. But I think the reason why the UAE thing is important is because this is a major um, initiative for both countries. And this shows a, a real depth and uh, of trust and uh uh, the breadth of their relationship. Um, it's really a, a sign of what China and the UAE have done over the past three years since signing their own comprehensive strategic partnership. So this is, I think, going to to really signal that uh, that the Emirates are a, a central pillar in China's Middle East policy. Um, relating to to this to this vaccine deal, um, have there have there been any kind of discussion about where the you know kind of these vaccines will be rolled out to? Like particularly whether whether any of them will be going to Africa? Well, I'm sure they will be because um, the UAE is has got um, ambitions for Africa. It's been deepening its trade and political relations, especially around the Horn. Um, so I'm sure that that we'll see a lot of that. Um, there was a story out of Reuters today, I believe, that that uh, Palestine is going to be receiving a lot of it. So this also kind of indicates how China is using this for political gains in the Middle East as a, as a way to kind of demonstrate some to some support to the Palestinian cause. This is important because, you know, I think a lot of folks in, uh, in Palestine feel that they had um, kind of been undermined through this uh deal of the century, that they didn't have a lot of input. And China, when the Abraham Accords were, was announced, uh, China really emphasized that they wanted to develop a, a peaceful solution to Israel and Palestine that supported the Palestinians. So I think the, that they're sending some of these vaccines to Palestine is also a pretty important step. And Kobus, don't forget that in the announcement between Ethiopian Airlines and Sainiao, Sainiao, of course, is the a logistics arm of Alibaba. Dubai was also mentioned as a hub for vaccine distribution. So this might be an extension of that arrangement as well. And using Emirates and the, the logistics operations that the Emirates has is, is probably part of that deal as well. But let's keep staying with the Emirates before we move on, because the Emirates is emerging to be one of the pillars of the Belt and Road in the region. And you talked about this on Twitter quite a bit last week in trying to explain why you felt that the UAE deal is more important than the Iran deal. In the Iran deal, you mentioned, and we're going to get to Iran in detail, so I don't want to get into it right now, but you mentioned that there were no specifics, there were no numbers, nobody knows really where the New York Times got that $400 billion, whereas the arrangement with the Emirates was highly specific, involved trust, and at the same time really shows an extension of their relationship in the UAE and in the Gulf. And I'm curious about how the UAE has been able more successfully than almost any other country in the region to balance relations with the United States and China. Because at the same time, while they're getting closer to the United States through the Abraham Accords, they're also buying more weapons from the Chinese. They're doing these deals on vaccines. There's trade and logistics operations that are being set up in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. How are they managing the the great power rivalry? Yeah, this is a really tough needle to thread. And I think the UAE has done it quite well. Um, and honestly, I, I don't know how long. I, I think they've always had an eye to 
this last presidential election. You know, so there's a lot of pressure when Mike Pompeo would visit the Middle East and say to the Israelis, to the Emiratis, to the Saudis, you can't cooperate with China on this sensitive stuff. And I think they just kind of waited out and said, look, this is important to us. And, and your relationship is also important to us. And we'll try to balance it. Um, but I think they they saw a point where maybe the position of the U.S. would change. So they, they've been pretty measured in how they've managed this relationship. Um, of course, the U.S., this is a security partner for the UAE. It's their most important international relationship. And with China, it's an economic partnership. So it, it it's largely seen as uh, compatible, I think, uh, until you get into issues like 5G and data um, collection and data centers and things like this. But yeah, you're right. The UAE's handled pretty well. So if we if we pivot to Iran, what in the Iran deal is actually new, and and you know what 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 did we inherit from before? The Iran deal has been on the table since 2016. You know when when Xi Jinping visited the Middle East his first time as, as the chairman of the CCP, he first went to Saudi. He signed this comprehensive strategic partnership deal. Then he went to Egypt, and then he went to Iran and signed the same deal with the Iranians. Um, it kind of flew under the radar, but you know this has to be taken in the context of, of this period right after the signing of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, where there was this hope that Iran was going to start to become more of a normal country, You know that there were positive inducements for it to change its regional behavior. And this was, I think, seen as kind of a reward. Look, if you're, if you're going to commit to, to being a more constructive actor, you get this partnership deal that the Saudis just got. Um, but, and this is why it's important, I think, is that when the U.S. general election happened later that year, and it was very clear that the Trump administration was going to be hard on Iran and hard on China, Beijing had no incentive to develop this partnership with, with Iran. And this is a very common trend in China-Iran relations, is that they, they pledge deep rhetorical support and they say, you know, civilizational brotherhood and thousands of years of Silk Road cooperation. But the reality is, Iran is a, uh, a regional power, a middle power um, that offers very little benefits to China, whereas its relationship with the U.S. is the, the single most important relationship for China. And in knowing this, they kind of would say nice things to Iran, but that deal never got developed. They said in 2016 that they were going to do trade. By 2026, they're going to be doing $600 billion worth of trade. And the fact is they've done almost nothing because there's been sanctions, because there's a ceiling. And, you know, it, it really just shows that when it comes down to it, China's not going to privilege Iran over the U.S. or the U.S. P- allies and partners. So what we've seen out of this that's new is just, I guess, that it's actually been signed. But what we've seen, the foreign ministry spokesperson of, uh, of China um, announced, you know, this there are no specifics, that this is kind of an aspirational uh, agreement. These are things that they would like to achieve in perfect conditions. Uh, but the reality is they're starting um, to develop this this partnership now, and for the past five years, it's just been stalled. Nothing's really happened. Um, the the Saudi one, they've had five years of implementation. It's already deep. The UAE one has been going very strong for three years. Um, you know, this the Sino Farm um, announcement is just a reflection of that. Whereas the Iranian deal is is really starting from from the ground floor, and they've got they've they've got nothing tangible to show for it yet. So the Iranian foreign ministry a spokesperson there said that this is technically a non-binding document, and, and because it's a non-binding document, they are not obligated under Iranian law to publish the details of the document. As you mentioned, Chinese foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian today mentioned uh, at the regular press briefing in Beijing, he said the China-Iran comprehensive cooperation plan focuses on tapping the potential of economic and cultural cooperation and charting a course for long-term cooperation. That's a word I want to get back to you on. But here's the most important point. He said, it neither includes any quantitative, specific contracts and goals, nor targets any third party. So he's coming out and saying what you've been saying all along, that this is more rhetorical, symbolic. The optics of it are more important than the actual substance of it. So if that's the case... Why do you think people in the United States and Europe are freaking out so much if there's no there there? Huh. Yeah, exactly. Why? I mean, I think because we keep seeing these headlines. There's one of um, in the New York Times, I think, yesterday. They keep doubling down on that 400 billion number, which no one really quite knows where they keep getting this number from. Right. So there was this leaked document that came out of you know Iran last year. And um, 
And there was a great breakdown of it. Uh, uh, the Wilson Center issued a report, I think, called Last Among Equals. It was written by Esfandar Batmanjeli and uh, Lucille Greer. And it was a really good document just showing, you know, um, why this isn't such a big deal. Um, this 400 billion thing, this this was leaked by Iran um, to this journalist of, of questionable sources. Uh, it was published in Petroleum Economist, I believe, or Petroleum Intelligence, uh, September 2019. And everybody who knew anything about the relationship just rolled their eyes. You know, $400 billion. Iran doesn't even have the capacity to absorb that much uh, investment. And, and China, if you look at the trend of its Belt and Road investments, it's it's been going in the opposite direction. So they're going to put that much money into a revisionist state that has no useful partners or allies in the region. Why would they do this? You know, and it's, I think it's pretty clear. This is a story that the Iranians were, were, were leaking to show that they have an alternative, that they have a lifeline. Um, but you don't see, like nobody in the Chinese foreign ministry until today has said anything about it. They've been asked in... in, in um, in their press briefings about it, I think twice at least since last July, and they've always um, declined to speak about it because they had no details. So as Eric mentioned, China is buying increasing amounts of, of Iranian oil and then and then kind of laundering it through other through other countries. So um, so it's kind of two part question in, is it, do, how in how much danger does that put China of of U.S. sanctions? Um, and then where do you see um, like you know how, where do you see by the Biden administration going? Did you foresee that they that they um, might revivify the the Iran deal? And if so, where would that for China? I think what we have, like just to step back a little bit, I think we have to put this visit from Wang in the context of the trip to Alaska, you know, earlier this month. Um, and actually, Yang Jiechi and, and, and Wang Yi did emphasize that Iran is something that, that uh, the US and China could work on, that they could coordinate policy on this. And I think this Iran deal is, is a reflection of that to say, look, we actually have some leverage, some positive leverage in Tehran that can be used. In, in part of a bigger project that might try to cool the U.S.-China uh, um, relations, or, or, or not cool it, but improve it. So I think, you know, what what's the Biden administration going to do? I have no idea. But they haven't shown a real appetite to get more deeply involved in the Middle East or the Gulf. Um, I think this looks like China saying, you know, look, we have influence in the region. We can be a positive actor. Uh, I think that this is really just a play to get to 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 improve the the state of the China U.S. relations. Interesting. You mentioned Yang Jiechi. For those of you not familiar with Yang, he is the top foreign policy official in the Politburo. He's kind of in the hierarchy, even above Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and very important. And of course, he was at the talks with Antony Blinken in Alaska. But it's interesting to consider Iran in the context of North Korea, because here again, this is an area where the Chinese have leverage that the United States does not. The United States depended on Chinese access to, into the North Korean government, and it's possible that the Chinese are trying to position themselves again as a potential lever into the Iranian government, and that gives the Chinese leverage in other parts of their relationship with the United States, say on Taiwan. You want us to help you with North Korea? You're going to have to stop selling weapons to, say, Taiwan, for example. This has traditionally been how they've used North Korea. I can see them also maybe potentially trying to build up Iran as a leverage point. As you said, it's not necessarily because of Iran itself. It's because of a much bigger issue as it relates to the geopolitics between the United States and China. Let's keep our, our journey going and uh, well, let's go to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, to me, is one of the most interesting stories in the China-Persian Gulf relationship, in part because of this surge of oil buying. In 2019, uh, there was a 47% increase in Chinese oil buys out of Saudi Arabia. A lot of that came at Africa's expense. For those who are regular listeners to the show, this is my favorite statistic that comes from uh, Professor David Shin or Ambassador David Shin at George Washington University. In 2008, China purchased 30% of its oil, came from three African countries. By 2018, that was down to just one African country, Angola, and the number was less than 18%. A lot of that shift has gone to Brazil and to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia today is the number one supplier uh, on a month-by-month -month basis, they alternate with Russia quite a bit. So there's an important energy relationship there. China and Wang Yi brought the Xinjiang message to the home of Mecca and Medina. How important was that? Yeah, this is always, you know, this is something we always talk about because obviously 
you'd expect that a lot of Middle Eastern countries would would take a harder line on China on the Xinjiang issue, and it just they, they never failed to be disappointed. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why the issue doesn't resonate, um, and one of them is that the way China frames their policy in Xinjiang, and I'm not saying I agree with this by any stretch, but they frame it as this is our response to political Islam. You know that there are there are revisionist groups, or there are groups that that have uh, you know anti-state um, agendas in, in Xinjiang, and this is how we deal with it. And if you look at a lot of countries in the Middle East, they also share the same concerns about political Islam, especially monarchies. Like, you know, Saudi has has had a very long, difficult relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. And, um, you know, one of the tenets of, of the Muslim Brotherhood is to replace monarchies with, a, with an Islamic form of government. So when China frames it this way, this is something that, that a lot of countries in the Middle East can accept. Um, it's, it's really not something that resonates very deeply. And another, another important issue is when you saw uh, Wang Yi visit Turkey, he greeted something that he's not going to see in most of the Middle East, protesters. You know, um, as, as uh, Turkish people were protesting the, the Uyghurs and uh, what's happening to the Uyghurs, you don't get protests in a lot of the rest of the Middle East. Um, and why this is interesting, I think, is because when I talk to a lot of people around, around the region, um, they say, look, the Uyghurs are, are Turkic people. You know, and Erdogan sees himself as a leader of the Sunni world. Why isn't he doing anything about this? Why do we have to do anything about this? So it, it kind of plays into this geopolitical rivalry within the Middle East, where where Turkey and Saudi have been clashing uh, as, as rival leaders to, for for Sunni countries, or Sunni countries rather, uh, throughout the region. So there's a lot going on there, I think. Do, do you foresee this this changing at any time? You know, is, is there is there a, a kind of a build of sympathy or a build of engagement with the Uyghur situation because it's 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 gaining so much attention in the West as well? It doesn't gain a lot of attention here. Like to be honest, most of the the media that you find throughout the region is state owned, so you know you don't see a lot of stories about this. Um, when I talk to my students, some of the more internationally focused students I have know about this, but the vast majority of, of them don't. Um, in fact, very few people know that there is even, you know, a big Muslim population in China. So it's not it's not a story that really resonates here, to be honest. Um, I know that a lot of um, Western diplomats are, are presenting it as a, a counter narrative to say, this is why you maybe should be concerned about dealing too closely with China, um, but but it just doesn't seem to take take hold. Kobus, it's interesting because there was an editorial, actually, no, I'm sorry, a column that was featured in a prominent Nigerian newspaper a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we featured this in the newsletter as well that admired the Chinese policies in Xinjiang, in part because they too in Nigeria are confronting this radical Islam in the form of Boko Haram. And there's been so much violence and so much frustration about the inability of the government to bring it under control. And they see China taking these extreme measures to bring Xinjiang under control, so, so to speak. And there's some admiration there. And this, this was a column in a major Nigerian newspaper. So I can see how in Saudi Arabia and other parts where they're fighting the Muslim Brotherhood, this too might be positioned and spun in such a way where it's actually seen as appealing. Uh, I'd like to talk about the relationship between Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. In many ways, it looked like there was a meeting of the minds between the Saudis and the Chinese in terms of positioning themselves against the United States. MBS's relationship with Washington has soured, uh, particularly since the Khashoggi killing and the fact that also there's just the United States doesn't depend on Saudi Arabia anywhere near as much as it did because it's more or less energy self-sufficient. At the same time, there's just a... Biden has really made it that he's not that interested in the special relationship with Saudi Arabia that it traditionally has had. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen a pivot in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh towards Beijing. What is the relationship like between MBS and, say, Xi Jinping? Is it purely transactional or is there something deeper there? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because, you know, uh, the, you mentioned the Jamal Khashoggi um, murder. And it was only a few months before that that the Crown Prince had made this massive tour of the U.S. You know, and he, I think he was on Oprah. He met Bill Gates. He, he hung out with The Rock. You know, it was a real big PR campaign, and it was, he was very well received in the States. Um, and then the Shoji murder happened, and 
he made his next big trip and it was to Pakistan, India, and China. And in all three countries, he was greeted like a future king. He was, he was, you know, got a big bear hug from Prime Minister Modi. Um, Prime Minister Khan from, from Pakistan picked him up in his own car and drove him to, to his house. And in China, you know, he was treated really well as, as well. Um, He's he's the point guard in the China relationship right now, as far as I can tell. So I mentioned the, the comprehensive strategic partnership that the Saudis and the Chinese signed in 2016. Um, they set up what's called the high level joint committee, where the, it's kind of a working committee to, to steer the partnership agreement. And it's it's co-chaired um, between, you know, um, by uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Han Zhang. And so Mohammed bin Salman has been making these, these regular trips to China or receiving Chinese visitors. And they've been doing a lot of um, deals, a lot of MOUs in, in areas where they're going to coordinate the Belt and Road with Saudi's Vision 2030, its development project. Um, so I don't know about his, his relationship with Xi Jinping. I imagine it's not, you know, too deep, but he certainly is, is in charge of the China docket for the Saudi government. And he's been very actively involved in that. The vice premier of uh, China was Zhang Gaoli uh, when the deal was announced, and uh, and when he retired, um, Han became the 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 guy who I guess took over the the portfolio for him. Pivoting to to Israel, the what did you make of this offer from China to to participate in the peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Uh, this is a very interesting one. You had a great tweet on this, by the way. If, I loved how you said nobody in the region's asking the Chinese to do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. This just seemed like theater to me, right? Like China has done this in the past. Um, I think in 2017, they also offered to, you know, uh, mediate. And really, uh, yeah, this is a problem that China doesn't have the answer to. You know, it doesn't have any skin in the game. Um, I think, again, you know, to go back to when the Abraham Accords were announced and China was caught kind of flat footed, they weren't expecting this. I mean, nobody was expecting it. Um, the the normalization between the UAE and, and Israel. And when when asked about it, all that uh, all that they could say in the foreign ministry was we would do better by the Palestinians, you know, if, if we were involved. And this is part of their, you know, uh, their vision as China as a leader of the, the global south, right, or the third world under Mao. So they've always used Palestine, support for Palestine as an issue um, to, to um, build a rapport with different Arab countries. Uh, but at the same time, they've always worked much more closely with Israel. So it's really just a rhetorical thing they've done. You know, it's, it's, it's again, it's been performance to say, yeah, we're there for the Palestinians. But in reality, they're doing tremendous high-tech trade with Israel and, and kind of swamping the Palestinian economy with cheap manufactured products. So it's not really a, a very balanced relationship. I think they, they and that made this magnanimous offer as a way just to say, look, this is how we're different from the U.S. right now. We're willing to do this, you know, uh, to bring the Palestinians back in. Whereas under Trump, of course, they were excluded. But, do, but doesn't this fit part of the declinist narrative that the Chinese have about the United States, that they are the declining power and that they're leaving space in the geopolitical arena in the Middle East that a rising power like China can fill? They know they're not competent to do it, but it's a no-lose situation. They get to earn a few brownie points and some headlines. They certainly got a lot of headlines, but they know they're never going to be called on by Netanyahu or anybody else or the Palestinian Authority to do this. So why not? And it just pokes the Americans a little bit to show that, you know, you're not as big as you used to be. Well, it's also, it's interesting that it, that it was announced on the day of the, the election in Israel when absolutely nobody was paying attention, right? You know, so nobody in Israel is saying like, oh, all the presses, you know, uh, Wang Yi is going to solve our, our, our huge security problem here. You know, no, yeah, so maybe they see it as, as uh, a, 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 I think it's kind of an empty gesture. It's just something that you can say um, without any kind of a consequence, like you said. Uh, I don't think they, that, that there's an element of the U.S. decline because I don't think China really believes that. Obviously, you know, another thing that came out of this trip was this five-point security plan for the Middle East, and it was quite empty. Um, because China knows that this is a space that is only occupied by the U.S., and their deep commercial presence here has been supported by the U.S. military presence. 
So China has been able to, you know, free ride, which is not a term I'm crazy about, but certainly they've been able to develop a very deep presence on the back of the U.S. security commitment. And they don't want to replace that. They don't see the U.S. as a declining Middle East power um, because it's not. You know, you look around and you see the troop numbers, the weapon sales, the, the political influence it has. And there's nobody that can challenge that. And China certainly has no ambition to. As Eric pointed out, there were all of these, you know, across the region, there were all of these kind of massive energy deals that that that, that were signed, um, and you know, with, with with some of these deals, you know, promising a kind of energy access for fifty years and so on. H- how does this square with China's announcement that it'll be carbon neutral by twenty thirty, and you know, and z- essentially zero carbon by twenty sixty? Like, how 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 does all of this oil buying kind of like fit into this wider kind of plan to, 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 to wean China off oil? Yeah, that's a great question because, uh, you know, that doesn't, that, that seems also a very aspirational target that, that isn't very likely to, to be achieved, right? In 2014, um, there's this China Arab States Cooperation Forum, which really doesn't get noticed very often. But every two years, it, it's, a, it's a multilateral forum for China. It's kind of like the FOCAC for the Middle East, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's only for the Arab countries. So it, Turkey, Israel and Iran aren't members. But, you know, every two years they have this, um, it's called the minister's meeting where the foreign minister of China and all the Arab League countries meet and they kind of map out what they're going to do over the next two years. And they rolled out this thing in 2014 called the one plus two plus three cooperation um, program. And one is energy. You know, energy is at the core of this is the way they termed it, energy at the core. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously this is driving a lot of what China's been doing in the Middle East. You look at the countries that China's trading the most with, that's got the highest value of its contracts, they're energy exporting countries. Um, so I, I really don't see this changing, you know, that, that they're going to stop using Middle East energy. Like you said, Saudi has been able to, to step up and become the number one supplier, uh, alternating with Russia, but typically it's Saudi. Um, you know, that's that's kind of why China's came here in the first place. And it's certainly been a, a motivating part of the relationship ever since. So this is not really going to be a long term relationship in one sense, only because the Chinese are, in fact, moving as quickly as possible in certain parts of their economy in the transportation sector, for example, into a post carbon era. And so their dependence on the Middle East and the Persian Gulf for oil eventually will fade away. And it doesn't seem like there's much behind energy. That's it. Well, but there's there's other numbers in that one plus two plus three, you know, so a part of it, like I said, especially in the Gulf, all these countries are trying to get into a post hydrocarbon economy, the single resource rentier model. Um, and you see that especially in the UAE, where they're trying to build, where they're actually pretty successful at building a post oil economy. And a lot of these vision programs, the Vision 2030, the Vision 2040 of Oman, the New Kuwait 2035, it's all about how they can use digital technologies and how they can use, um, you know, create these new industries to make a more sustainable economy. And they're working very closely with China on this. So China's got tremendous contracting here. They're also trying to focus on renewables, which is part of the, the three in the equation. And this is very interesting where you see Chinese companies that are, are actively working with you know, building the solar plant in Dubai or working with Saudi to develop renewables um, to, to focus on nuclear energy. So the energy relationship could actually change where China's actually exporting a lot of technology or, or expertise um, to help these countries get into their post hydrocarbon um, situation. Um, but then the other part of it is, you know, the Middle East has always been important before there was oil because it's just such a geostrategically important location. And for China's Belt and Road Initiative, if you have aspirations to cross Eurasia and the Indian Ocean region, this is in the middle of it, right? So a lot of China's, um, the stability that it needs for the Belt and Road Initiative needs, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, especially the Red Sea and the, and, and the Gulf region to, to be somewhat stable. So I think this region, even if they weren't importing a lot of oil, it would still have quite a bit of significance for its larger um, geostrategic ambitions. So w- w- one one of the one of the areas we haven't touched on so far is Oman. Um, what 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 was the kind of headlines coming out out of Wang Yi's visit to Oman? Modest, um, and it's interesting because Oman is a very geostrategically important country. You know, it's got that long Arabian Sea or Indian Ocean coastline, um, and China announced back in 2017 that it was going to pour a lot of money into this fishing village 
that the Omanis had wanted to develop into a free zone for, for decades. It's a, a small village called Dukum. And, um, you know, the Omanis have been trying to develop this with other, you know, sources of foreign direct investment. They talked to the Koreans, the Singaporeans, uh, and it just never really took. And in 2017, um, there was just this, this wave after wave of stories about Chinese investment that was going to total about $11 billion. So f- there was a point, you know, where Oman was exporting, I think something like 48% of its exports went to China. Um, and then you saw China um, offering a loan so it could cover its federal budget in 2017. And then all these big projects that were going to to go into Dukum. And the reason why Dukum is important is because it allows con- it, it would allow Oman to bypass the Hormuz Straits. You know, they build pipelines and refineries that would allow countries to get Persian Gulf oil from, you know, the, the uh, Arabian Sea coastline. And the Hormuz dilemma kind of got solved that way. Um, so there was a point in 2017 where it looked like Oman was going to be a really, really, really big partner for China. But the reality is it's kind of slowed down since then. And uh, early last year, Sultan Qaboos passed away. Uh, it seems that the the new Sultan Haitham has been rethinking the China relationship. Um, you didn't really see a lot out of this trip. It was mostly the same kind of stuff where they talked about how they're going to focus on developing the uh, the China GCC foreign free trade agreement, which has been on the on the books forever now. Um, there was a lot of momentum for that up until 2017 when the Qatar crisis happened. Um, now that the Qatar seems to be the the crisis is has been solved. Uh, this is something China's putting a lot of energy into again, is trying to get this free trade agreement off the ground. So I guess that was the big headline of the Oman trip. Um, one that you guys didn't mention actually in the intro is he went from Oman to Bahrain. He did go to Bahrain. I knew I was missing a country. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, poor little Bahrain always gets uh, gets left off. And, and honestly, in terms of what China does in the Gulf, Bahrain doesn't really feature very often. But last month, uh, Tencent announced that they're going to put a lot of money into a, a data processing center in Bahrain. So, you know, I guess that's that's the focus there is, is just kind of working with Bahrain on, on tech issues. Um, but yeah, you know, all in all, those two countries didn't really feature too, too significantly. One other thing I'd say, um, a Chinese diplomat actually pointed this out on Twitter, is I believe it was in February of this year that Yang Jiechi visited Kuwait and Qatar. Um, and this marks, this marks the first time, I think, that all six GCC countries have had such high-level um, visits from Chinese officials in the same year. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a pretty big year for China, China Middle East stuff. So two countries not on the itinerary this year. You mentioned Qatar, also Iraq. Let's first start with Qatar. Qatar signed that big 10, uh, 10-year deal for natural gas with Sinopec. What can we spec- expect out of Qatar relations going forward? Yeah, so this is really interesting because China and Qatar were on a pretty impressive trajectory um, a few years ago. I think it was in 2015 that the Emir of Qatar visited China, got a big state visit. They signed a comprehensive, or a strategic partnership agreement, rather, um, which is the next level down from what the UAE and Saudi and Iran have. Um, and typically those get upgraded um, when the relationship is developed. Uh, China's uh, Chinese companies building the uh, opening and closing venue for the World Cup in Qatar. There was a lot of big construction deals. There's something like $8 billion in deals signed in 2015 alone. Um, so it looked like Qatar and China were really, you know, uh, on the way up. And then when this this dispute happened between Qatar and, and the UAE, Saudi, Egypt, and Bahrain, um, China said all the right things. You know, they said what you would expect them to say, that uh, they're not going to choose sides, sides in this dispute and it has to be solved by the countries themselves and, and we'd be happy to mediate if, if need be. Um, but what you saw was that they kind of tilted towards the other four countries and, and Qatar didn't really see the same kind of uh, um, engagement for that three or, three or four year period. Um, when Xi Jinping came to Abu Dhabi in 2018 and signed this, comp- the, upgraded their partnership to a comprehensive one, and there's just been just reams of huge detail or deals, you know, multi-billion dollar deals between the UAE and China over these years. Um, a couple months later, the Emir of Qatar went to Beijing and nothing, just crickets. They said, yeah, we're going to continue with the same deal we have. We're going to continue to work at the same level. And the reason I think is pretty clear, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, and this is 
this applies to Iran as well. The Belt and Road Initiative is about connecting countries and regions. And, you know, at that point, Qatar was connected to very little, you know, Turkey and Iran. Um, the value of working with, with Qatar was, was significantly less than the value of working with, say, the UAE or Saudi, um, these countries that are deeply networked throughout the Middle East and these logistics hubs and, and, and infrastructure hubs, you know, working with those countries brings you into a wider network of Middle East countries. Working with Qatar didn't. So China just kind of quietly didn't do much. Um, after the, the dispute ended uh, in January this year, you know, Yang Jiechi was there pretty soon afterwards. And uh, I think what this shows us that, uh, you know, this, this LNG deal you mentioned, um, the talks about resuming the, the free trade agreement, you know, having Qatar back in from the cold really opens a lot of opportunities for China GCC stuff. And it also opens the door for Qatar to start capitalizing on Chinese uh, contracting and investment. So I think you're going to see a lot more happening with Qatar in, in the next uh, short, in the short term. And very quickly on Iraq, now there was a very big deal that was announced last year, a $2 billion oil supply contract with a company called Zhenhua. Zhenhua is not a well-known company, but it is the oil trading arm of Norinco. And Norinco is the mega Chinese state-owned uh, weapons manufacturer. So that was really interesting. That looked like a big deal. Iraq has been increasing its oil supplies to China. In fact, some people joke China was the the big beneficiary of the U.S. war in Iraq because they have moved in in a big way to to buy a lot of Iraqi oil. However, that deal fell apart. What is the state of China-Iraq relations right now? Hmm, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not the guy to talk to about China-Iraq because I, <laughs> there's, there's only too so many countries benefits. in the region. Too many countries. Too many countries. But, you know, when I look at it, again, like what you see is China prizes stability and, and interconnectivity and, and, you know, working with status quo countries that, that are, are, are somewhat stable. And I think in the case of Iraq, um, that doesn't really tech, tick all the boxes. So I'm not sure. I think Iraq also, the government has a lot of, um, you know, uh, influence or they, they typically have had a lot of influence from the U.S. and maybe that limits what China could get out of it, but, but I'm not sure. You know, if, if you look at the region as a whole, um, obviously, as, as you mentioned, it, from, from China's perspective, it's, it's crucial for a bunch of reasons, but, but, but also because it's such, such a key region for the Belt and Road Initiative. But how is the Belt and Road Initiative viewed from, from the perspective of, the middle, of middle East countries themselves? Oh, very positively. Um, it's an opportunity, right? Like, it's, it's good to have another superpower engaged. Um, a lot of these countries have deep um, development concerns. And when they look at what China has to offer, I mean, so you look at China in 1978 compared to China today, and, and a lot of these countries would say, wow, how, do, how did you do that? And how can we do that? Um, so if, if, if they think if working with China on Belt and Road will, will help them solve this development issue, then let's do it. Um, in the Gulf, you don't see the same kind of uh, narratives resonating, like the debt trap, which we just kept getting slammed with for years, um, or, or how uh, local labor forces aren't engaged. Again, in the Gulf, you're not going to see a bunch of Emiratis working on building you know, high rises or pipelines. They, they outsource that to foreign labor anyway. So there's not a lot of the same negative narratives. And one thing that I think is really interesting, I bring this up a lot in my you know, public engagements. Typically in the Middle East, what they're used to hearing from the West especially is nothing but negative stories about how the Middle East is a problem to be solved. Um, when China talks about the Middle East, I mean, they're not naive. They know that there's a lot of political instability and, and security problems, but whenever they talk about it, it's always, you know, the Middle East is an important hub in the Belt and Road and interconnectivity and Silk Road relations. And, you know, they frame it in a very positive way. And for a region that's constantly hearing about what a mess it is, it's pretty nice to have a great power come in and, and tell them they're pretty for a change, you know. So um, I think they really, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the Belt and Road here. Well, with that in mind, let's end our discussion on the great power rivalry that we talked about earlier, that the United States now is increasingly trying to build a coalition of democracies and like-minded countries to challenge China. There was just a conversation last week with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson to this effect. Biden is talking about it. Anthony Blinken is talking about it. 
the Persian Gulf countries and the Middle East uh, have very longstanding deep ties with the United States. As you mentioned, they've played the balance between China and the United States very well. It does seem like as tensions rise between the United States and China that they may be called on to make some difficult decisions about the Belt and Road, about Huawei, on Xinjiang, some of these very core issues that are very sensitive in the United States today. How do you think these countries are going to navigate these increasingly treacherous waters? Well, I think, first of all, you know, the great power narrative that we keep hearing about, the great power competition, is something that really gets a lot of people's hackles up here, and I'm sure in, in where you guys are watching from Africa or in Southeast Asia or wherever, you know, like nobody wants to be a theater of competition between China and the U.S. Um, a lot of countries here say, look, we have deep political and, and um, security relations with, with the Americans. Um, China's coming with with things that we want, you know, whether it's development or, or um, economic um, assistance or, or investment or contracting or governance, which is something I think that gets dismissed a lot. But, you know, Western countries typically come to the region and say, look, if you want to solve your problems, you've got to, you've got to change the way you do politics. You've got to, you know, adopt democracy and you've got to start respecting human rights. And a lot of things that are very important, you know, to me as a, as a Western liberal. Um, but when China comes here, excuse me, they, they don't, they don't have that narrative. They don't say you've got to change things. They say, look, we did it our way. You can do it your way. We can show you what we've done that worked. And really, again, like when when um, I show my students, my Emirati students, pictures of China in 78 versus China now and Shenzhen before 1980 and Shenzhen now, they don't, they're not staggered. Like, you know, my friends in Canada are, they're like, oh, how did they do that? Because that's exactly what the UAE and, you know, Dubai and Abu, Abu Dhabi have done. Um, so they see it as, as, you know, a place that has a, a similar ambition, a similar model. And in terms of governance, especially uh, when I talk to my Emirati students about issues of democracy, um, it doesn't really go down well. They know what it's about, but when they say, look at, look at Brexit, look at the U.S. for the past four years, you know, we don't want that. And look how China's handled COVID, you know, if, if, if their government has been able to mobilize its resources and, and deal with this pandemic in a pretty successful way, maybe we can learn from that. So I think, you know, again, like how they're going to, how they're going to try to navigate this, this pressure is I think they're going to probably um, try to play both sides the way that smaller powers always do when there's this kind of systemic change. You know, what can you get out of each side? I think it's good for everybody that China's engaged in the Middle East and that China has some skin in the game because this make, makes China a more engaged political actor as well. They've got to actually, you know, step up and, and be involved in this stuff. So I, I think they're going to probably uh, see it as, as, a, as a net gain. Okay. Jonathan Fulton is an assistant professor of political science at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, and he's also a senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, especially so close to the trip when it's still fresh. And it was really, again, a lot of fantastic insights. Your Twitter feed is absolutely indispensable to me every single day. Tell the good people where they can find you on the social networks. Sure. So some Jonathan Fulton jerk in the UK took my uh, (laughs) handle before I could get it. So I'm Jonathan D. Fulton. And uh, if that that other Jonathan's listening, you know, uh, watch out, buddy. You want it back. Yeah, I want it back. You want it back. We'll, we'll put a link to that in, uh, in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Like I say, this is one of my absolute must-listen podcasts. You do such a great job. So many interesting uh, voices that you're presenting. It's, it's really just a fantastic show. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Kobe, for the Africanists in our audience, I think they're going to recognize a lot of the themes that Jonathan brought up about how the Chinese come with a more positive narrative, this idea that the Middle East and the Persian Gulf was always kind of a basket case and the United States was coming in to try and fix it or tell people what to do. Boy, that is something that resonates a lot in Africa as well. The idea that it's transactional, the Belt and Road, the development narrative, all of that seems to parallel what we hear about the Chinese in Africa as well. The most interesting thing that jumped out to me about the conversation, though, and and I'd like to get your take on this, was how the Chinese prioritize or value countries and interconnectedness seems to be one of the most important filters. So the idea that Qatar, when it wasn't connected to other countries, 
was less important to the Chinese, the moment that Qatar is now more interconnected after its conflict with the Saudis is over, then Yang Jiechi shows up. And I think that might be a very important lesson for developing countries, that if you want to attract the Chinese in this post-resource era, that is, we've talked about with Deborah Braudigam and Kevin Gallagher in our previous show about how lending for resource for infrastructure deals is going to go down, how the Chinese are much more interested in the Belt and Road and logistics and distribution and all of those other things, that interconnectivity is really one area that they're going to prize going forward. Yes, and this is this is also also an era an, an area that that African governments prize, you know, increasingly. Um, so you know, n- no one no one is 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 ignoring the fact that that China is just um, is, is in the process of, of of finalizing this massive new internet cable to to um, Africa's east coast, um, and you know th- that's just one example of of this kind of connectivity that I think African governments are getting increasingly obsessed about, particularly as the African Continental Free Trade Agreement starts kicking in. Um, so you know, I, 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 it, it's another example of how of how that just puts China and these developing countries on the same page and in a page that that western countries are not on you know because because they they you know like with internet provision for example one one gets a distinct uh, impression that that many western countries don't particularly care whether africa has internet or not or strong internet or not and you know and and that and africans really do care you know um so so it's it, it provides this, this kind of very natural organic kind of space of cooperation even if these these governments tend to like have disagreements with china about about politics this is still this kind of space for like neutral neutral interaction and cooperation that internet cable that you mentioned is the peace cable that's the i think it's pakistan east africa connecting europe cable believe it or not yes. uh, that is built in part by huawei marine and that is going to have drop points in djibouti in mombasa in south africa and there's a great little fun fact that came with this that we reported last week that Every second of connectivity on that new peace cable in Africa will bring 90,000 hours of Netflix. That's the capacity of this new cable. Every second, 90,000 hours of Netflix content can pass through that cable. So that's going to bring an enormous amount of connectivity. By the way, it's also connecting into Marseille in France as well. So that is going to complicate the geopolitical orbit, particularly with the United States kind of bearing down on Huawei connected infrastructure. But this idea of interconnectivity is very interesting. And going back to Wang Yi, Wang Yi chose Tanzania as one of his stops on his Africa tour back in January. Tanzania now fashions itself as the logistics and transportation hub in East Africa. That was a role that Kenyatta in Kenya wanted to try and establish, but his standard gauge railway simply didn't go the distance and cross the border. Now, Tanzania envisions building a pan-East African interconnected railway network using standard gauge connected into the ports. I can see now Tanzania becoming much more important using the mindset that Jonathan kind of laid out for how the Chinese are making decisions in the Persian Gulf. Yes, me too. Um, you know, and 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 just it's it's also I think interesting that China is just setting interconnectivity as a template for development. Um, you know, so so it just it, it just slots into into its its kind of discourse in the entire global south. Um, and you, you know, and 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 with that, you you get this this I think from from Beijing's perspective, very kind of kind of pleasing prospect of. Different countries competing to be more connected to China and more connected to each other, which then f- fits into connections with China. You know, so so I, I can see how you know interconnectivity is just this kind of gift that keeps on giving to China, which is and be, because there's no there's no way around it. Like you know, kind of no one no one wants to be isolated. Um, and if if interconnectivity also means being connected to China, then you know from the Chinese perspective, everyone wins. And that ultimately is what the Belt and Road is about, which is creating a Sinocentric world. The idea of the Belt and Road, I think, is misunderstood in many parts of the U.S. and Europe, where they think everything has to pass through China. But using this interconnectivity mindset, the idea is that tea will go from Tanzania or Kenya through Dubai onto Kyrgyzstan, never going through China, but it will use the peace cable, it will use Chinese ports, Chinese shipping networks, Chinese cryptocurrency, all of that is the interconnectivity that's being laid out. 
And that's really what I'm seeing the Belt and Road kind of evolve to. And I think the insights from Jonathan were very interesting about how it's making decisions in the Persian Gulf. And that's why it's so important that we start looking beyond Africa into other regions, Latin America, Central Asia, the Persian Gulf, here in Southeast Asia as well. And I think we can glean insights into what the Chinese are doing, because if we only look at what's happening in Africa, it's actually quite limited in terms of China's broader diplomatic agenda. There is a lot going on in other parts of the world that we can learn from. Yeah, and and also I think what what when we t- when we tend to kind of you know isolate Africa in terms of its its like classic continental as a classic continental block, and particularly even even this kind of artificial um, you know division between between North Africa and and Sub-Saharan Africa, what you really miss is how closely together African development is is starting to weave into Western Asian development. Um, you know, there's so much back and forth between Dubai and Nairobi, for example. There's so much connectivity between between East Africa and and you know the western parts of Asia and China is very very happy to to play in that space it's a perfect space for for it to, to work within and it's it's something you know that that I think there, there's such a kind of a kind of calcified thinking about Africa that that it's difficult I think for many people to to think of how to, to remember how close Africa is to the Middle East and even to India um you know and and as you say kind of belt and belt and road connectivity is gonna is gonna increase those linkages even more than they'll you know kind of increase you know even as they're increasing linkages between China and the rest of the world and there's a lot of movement within the Chinese diplomatic staff between the MENA divisions and the sub-saharan Africa divisions uh, where you are Cobus in South Africa Let's not forget that Ambassador Chen Xiaodong is the former director general of the Middle East North Africa Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so he oversaw foreign policy in the Middle East North Africa. Now he's in South Africa. So there's a lot of cross-pollination. I look at the bios of a lot of Chinese diplomats and they are going back and forth. So that's super interesting as well. I don't think that the Chinese have the hard and firm lines between Africa, the Middle East, the Gulf, as traditionally the United States and Europe have had in the past. So I think that's a very important distinction. So let's leave our conversation there. These are issues that we cover every day. We are expanding our coverage to include a lot more of the Middle East and North Africa and the Persian Gulf, in part because of what Kobus just said, because those lines are artificial. And we believe that there's a lot of engagement that really needs to be studied in the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden area as well, where the Chinese are very active in the Indian Ocean, in military security, anti-piracy, trade. All of that is playing out in these regions. That's what we cover every day in our daily email newsletter. We would love for you to become a subscriber. We're very humbled by the growth in the subscriber numbers. Thank you so much to all of our podcast listeners who took advantage of our special offer of getting a 20% discount using the promo code podcast at checkout. Go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Again, use the promo code podcast with not 20% off the price of an annual subscription. So thank you to all of you who have taken advantage of that. We're so excited that you're part of this daily community that we've been building for the past year and a half about China Africa, and more and more China Global South issues. And so we're very humbled by the wonderful reception that we've been getting for that. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Erica Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter, Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. Mm-hmm.